Hello, and welcome to Community Connections, a show written, produced, and presented by SCAN, your Senior Citizens Activities Network. We plan to present programs that are interesting and informative for both you and us. My name is Marianne Fama, your first presenter. An important part of our show is to bring into your home programs that will entertain you and inform you. So let's go. Our first segment is about Beacon of Life. Beacon of Life is a local program that provides all-inclusive daycare for seniors. Let's hear from some of their participants about what Beacon of Life has to offer. Beacon of Life, located in Oceanport, New Jersey, provides all-inclusive care for seniors. The criteria for membership is that participants must be 55 or older, they must live in a PACE service area, they must have one or more health conditions that meet nursing home eligibility, and they must live in a community with the support of PACE organization. PACE stands for Programs of All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly. It was created to provide seniors with health and recreational care while staying in the community. Ann Cahill, recreational supervisor, talked about their daily activities. The most important program here is bingo. <laughs> and they love bingo and we make sure that we have it available to everybody, including those at home that don't come in. So we do phone bingo as well. And everybody at home that wants to play bingo has cards at home and we call them up and we play bingo. The goal is to provide seniors with flexibility to receive health care and recreation while remaining a part of the community. Most importantly, the participants love being there. We saw how seniors can enjoy the health care and recreational activities. For more information, go to beaconpace.com. At the Save Green Project from New Jersey Natural Gas, we're bringing you rebates and incentives, including 0% APR financing, right on your natural gas bill to help make energy efficiency affordable. And with the possibility of no upfront costs and special incentives for moderate income customers, investing in equipment upgrades doesn't have to be out of reach. Go to SaveGreenProject.com for details on available rebates and incentives to help you upgrade to energy efficient HVAC and water heating equipment. You could also be eligible for thousands of dollars in incentives for seal up and insulation fixes. In the long run, you could be saving money on your energy bills too. Visit us at SaveGreenProject.com. That's SaveGreenProject.com. Welcome back to Community Connections. My name is Bill Sharkey. SCAN hosted our monthly music series at the Monmouth Mall outside of Macy's. SCAN's music series is sponsored by the Grunin Foundation, Investors Bank, and Ocean First Bank. The musical guest was singer-songwriter Colton Kaiser. Colton Kaiser is a Monmouth County resident and graduated from Monmouth University. He grew up daydreaming in class and writing and singing his own original songs. As he grew as a person, so does his work. He's been quietly chipping away and continuing to perfect his craft. He is spreading his music by traveling and touring the country. Colton is currently prepared to release his third record. His music is a mixture of Jim Croce, Dave Matthews, Ed Sheeran, and the Beatles. So sit back, relax, close your eyes, enjoy while Colton and Cody play some great music.
At the Save Green Project from New Jersey Natural Gas, we're bringing you rebates and incentives, including 0% APR financing, right on your natural gas bill to help make energy efficiency affordable. And with the possibility of no upfront costs and special incentives for moderate income customers, investing in equipment upgrades doesn't have to be out of reach. Go to SaveGreenProject.com for details on available rebates and incentives to help you upgrade to energy-efficient HVAC and water heating equipment. You could also be eligible for thousands of dollars in incentives for seal-up and insulation fixes. In the long run, you could be saving money on your energy bills, too. Visit us at SaveGreenProject.com. That's SaveGreenProject.com. Welcome back to Community Connections. In our April show, we presented the discussion which we had facilitated on the story behind the preparation of JFK's funeral. Many of us remember those awful days in November 1963 when our country's 35th president was assassinated. The days that followed were filled with such sadness our nation prepared to bury the country's youngest president. Here now, my continuing discussion on this very somber topic with Scans, Carl Lilvik. Welcome back to Community Connections from Scan. I'm Bill Sharkey, and we're going to start a second half of the show talking about the preparation behind the scenes and the burial of our President John F. Kennedy. Again, I'm here with retired Lieutenant Colonel Carl Lilvik. So we, we're now at the stage of preparation of the funeral. So, Carl, tell us a little about details. Tell us about the right. casket. Tell us how it was selected. Who well, was involved? I, as I mentioned uh, previously, that the uh, uh, my classmate Sam Bird identified the casket as as being damaged. They they uh, requested that they get another one. So what happened is the Secret Service, and uh, <coughs> I know you don't like the term uh, bill, but members of the Irish Mafia that were uh, at, uh, friends of the president uh, went to Growler's funeral home yes. and uh, selected a casket uh, and asked that the Growler people go to Bethesda, Maryland, uh, where they were doing the autopsy to prepare the body. Uh, it was not known then whether there would be an open casket or a closed casket. So the idea was to prepare the body for an opening if that was the case. So the time went by, it took hours and hours to, to repair the damage that had been done to the president. Uh, so late uh, or early in the morning, uh, they loaded, uh, loaded is not the proper term, they, they put the president's body into this new casket, put it on a cart, took it out to the ambulance that had brought him to the hospital. And that's when Sam and his crew had gotten the flag from Growlers, and they did a formal ceremony putting the flag on top of the casket, which wasn't there when it came off the aircraft. From there, they then went to the White House. In preparation for the uh, ambulance coming and the president's body coming, uh, Sergeant Shriver had asked for some escorts from the gate to the East Wing. And what they did is they called the Marine Corps barracks and the Marine Corps sent over a dozen members of the drill team. They got there in about 17 minutes after being called at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. The body uh, arrives, the ambulance arrives, and uh, as I, I think I mentioned, there were six pallbearers, bearers of the casket. And Sam, uh, typically the officer walks behind the casket as it's being carried. As they were going through the, uh, the door, uh, it turned out the casket was so heavy, they yelled back, you know, Lieutenant, Lieutenant. Um, he ran up, stepped up, grabbed the casket, they carried it in, and put it on a catafault, which was a replica of President Lincoln's catafault there in the East Room. The casket was extremely heavy. Could I stop you right there? Yeah. I'm saying, who selected the casket? What kind of a casket was it? It was the best casket Growlers had. It was a, an African mahogany casket. The wood was about 500 years old. It weighed, guesstimates range from about 1,100 to 1,300 pounds. 
And not that you're a funeral director, but what, what is basically, uh, what does a regular casket weigh? Yeah, five to six hundred. So this is doubled in weight? Uh, double. They had six people, which was the classic number. Uh, Sam, the next day, added two more men to their, uh, got a, a Marine and another Navy person to be on the team. Now, these team, this team, the thing to remember is this team did not, had never worked together. They were multi-service, but they never did this type of thing before, so there was a lot of practice required. Uh, so President Kennedy is lays in state within the White House uh, from about 4 o'clock in the morning on, um, on Saturday, and he is there until noon, 1 o'clock on Sunday, when he is to be moved to the, to the Capitol Dome for, to lie in state. Interesting thing also is remember that uh, talked about whether the casket would be open or not closed. A lot of discussion. There was a lot of angst about the idea that the president should be seen open in the in the rotunda. M Mrs. Kennedy decided no, absolutely not. But in the early morning, seven eight o'clock in the morning, she came with Robert Kennedy to where the casket was in that East Room and ask that it be opened. Did, is that the time that she gave her, her ring? No, she gave the ring back in, in Texas. Oh. That went into the casket in Texas. Okay. What she did here was put two letters in, one from Caroline, one from John John, in the casket, and clipped off locks of his hair. Okay. So that was early in the morning. By one o'clock, she's leaving uh, the White House the entourage is leaving the White House, going to the Capitol. Uh, President Kennedy and the whole Kennedy family were, were, were very respectful, were very enamored of the military. So Mrs. Kennedy said she wanted particularly special forces. Now, he, he was admired by the special forces because he's the one that authorized them to have Green Berets. And uh, that was a, a distinguishing thing for special people. So uh, she had special forces come up from Fort Bragg. Then they put teams together. They had a um, escort to the Capitol on the back of a caisson, uh, 12 on each side in twos, and then 12 men to the rear. I, I, I want to stop you and go, just go back a little as far as now. This is a heavy casket. Yeah. Military never have experienced carrying a heavy casket. Was there a lot of preparation in, in basically, you know, doing this casket? Could you tell us a little about well, that? Well, yeah, there was. There was a lot. Of, at this time frame, it was more uh, before going to the Capitol was a lot of uh, flag business, folding the flag, uh, and then after they, they got to the Capitol, they in, put the, the um, casket on the actual Lincoln catafalque, which was kept at the Capitol. Uh, they left, and that's when they realized that they had carried it up the steps, up the steps, holding it level, and here you have Sam in the back holding it up like this. So, so it was nine, nine people. Nine time. people he had to help uh, to carry it up. So they went back. Later on in the afternoon, they had to prepare for the next day. The next day, the casket was going to be moved from the Capitol to St. Matthew's. So they went to St. Matthew's to check that out. Uh, they saw the long aisle to be the casket had to be carried on the weight, and he asked for a church truck to put it put it on to move it down there. So they left, and later in the evening, you know, they kind of caught a little nap here and there, and they decided that the tomb of the unknown soldiers was closed at midnight. Sam took his team got a training casket, which only weighs a couple hundred pounds, uh, that they used for military burials, for training uh, the uh, people. Loaded it with sandbags that weighed 45, 50 pounds, put it in there, and they went to the Tomb of the Unknown, where there are uh, about uh, two-thirds of the number of steps that at the Capitol, but the same type of design. 
So they carried it up and down, up and down. And they all said, this is, this is nothing weight-wise like what we're going to carry. So there's discussion whether it was one, two, or Sam. Somebody, and I like to say Sam did, got on top of the casket and then went up and down, up and so down. So they were practicing at night at, doing at night, this? At midnight, 1 o'clock. Two o'clock at midnight, and the and the public really didn't know no, anything no, about no, this. No, 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 no. This, this is this is what I, I find fascinating, and and the other thing I would like you to basically throw out some statistics as far as the changing of the guard, how many people was involved. Yeah, you know, there there's starting at the White House uh, when the casket was brought in. There there's a death watch. It's referred to. There's a uh, joint service. Uh, military, there's someone put at each corner of the casket, there's an officer in charge, and they are there usually at parade rest or attention. They change every half hour. They had a death watch on that casket for 52 hours and changed every half hour, which makes it uh, roughly, uh, uh, you know, 102, 104 times they change Jeez. and they come up and they have a ritual there's a 21 count uh, when they change over I, I don't know the details on how they do it but you know it, it's uh, very surprising uh, very interesting uh, and lots of practice practice practice, practice. I, I know we've we've got a short time and maybe we'll carry this into a third part because there's a lot of information but I do want to uh, move from from the capital uh, to the church and tell us while they were taking the casket in the church a little bit about Cardinal Cushing, yeah. you know, to do the uh, yeah, services. Yeah, well, they, they, uh, uh, Sam and the crew went in advance of the, um, of the caisson. The caisson went uh, to the White House, then picked up all the uh, dignitaries and they walked to the, to the church. Uh, Sam was there to, and his crew were there to take the casket and and he knew that there was going to be a blessing on the casket uh, by the, the presiding um, uh, cardinal. cardinal, which was Cardinal Cushion from Boston, and he was a personal friend of the family. So they have the casket they're holding, they're going up the steps, and as just as they're just barely getting on the stairs, he walks out and he starts uh, giving a blessing on the casket. And Sam's saying, whoa, whoa, he didn't know he said this. He so didn't know whether he's going to say, Cardinal, you got to stop. So they're holding this heavy 1,800-pound uh, casket, and, and they're probably sweating, even, though it's, no, even though it's November, and the Cardinal's putting in the water. He's also doing the incense, and it's like, uh, yeah. going to make anybody <laughs> sick. How can I hold that? There was a sergeant. You know? sergeant that was there was, it got in his eyes, and he thought he was going to die with the incense that was happening. Uh, he just getting choked up. So he, they, er, it's moments of fear. You know, the f sense that they're gonna let go, the sense that they're gonna throw up. So. Uh, okay, I, I, we've got about another minute left, but I truly believe that we need to go to another segment because we're now, right now, we're at the, the church. At the church. And, uh, and the march from the church to Arlington Cemetery is another show that we must include in this in this story. Otherwise, we'd be amiss of not telling the proper story here. So, we please, again, stay with us. It'll be really quick. I hope you enjoyed the story. If not, tell me why you don't enjoy the story. If you like it, please check more than like. Okay? I appreciate it. We'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. If the black dog of depression makes you feel like the saddest soul on earth, you're not alone. Around 350 million people share this debilitating but treatable condition. If you're worried about someone, ask if they're okay. If you're not doing so well yourself, ask for help. There is no shame in doing so. The only shame is missing out on life. So get help, be helped, and always hold on to hope. Welcome back to Community Connections. For five years now, as part of Senior Expo, Macy's, in conjunction with SCAN, the Senior Citizens Activities Network, has sponsored a fashion show with clothing of special interest to seniors. 
After a two-year hiatus, the show returned with models, both male and female, who are also members of SCAN. With the assistance of a Macy's clothing consultant, each of the 15 models selected the clothing he or she wore. With Lou Russo, radio personality of the morning show The Point, both models and audience experienced a very special event. So make yourself comfortable, enjoy the presentation with models showing clothing of the moment, which is both fashionable and well-priced. The Senior Citizens Activities Network recently hosted our traditional free Senior Expo and Senior Fashion Show at the Monmouth Mall. After a three-year pause thanks to the pandemic, the show took place on Friday, May 13th. The event began with the Senior Expo featuring over 35 area vendors, including Macy's, RWJ Barnabas, New Jersey Natural Gas, Raven Health, Imperial Healthcare, Hackensack Meridian Health, and many, many more. Hundreds of attendees gathered to learn about the services offered by these great organizations while participating in free health screenings. The Expo was followed by the Senior Fashion Show, another tradition featuring 12 senior models outfitted completely by Macy's. The event was emceed by Lou Russo and Shannon Holly of 94.3 The Point Radio and Tom Hayes, Director of Customer and Community Relations for New Jersey Natural Gas. We hope that you enjoyed the SCAN Macy's Fashion Show. New clothing will make you feel good about yourself, especially clothing that is modern and well-priced. So head for Macy's where the consultants will assist you in making you feel as comfortable and as fashionable as a model. <laughs>